Welcome back. We are having our book discussion about social sanity in an Insta world. I am Sarah Zylstra and I am delighted to be joined here by Stephanie Greer, who is the author of Chapter 6 on Relationships. Stephanie is, she got married during the pandemic, interestingly, in a, one of those pandemic weddings that no one could go to, so she had to be super creative. Um, and then she has a little boy who is one year old. She lives in Baltimore where she works for the Garden Church, um, primarily focusing on thinking about planting healthy gospel-centered churches in areas, under-resourced areas. Stephanie, welcome. It's so good to have you here. It's good to be here. Let's jump right in. Can you tell me, um, can you remember getting your first social media account? What was that like for you? Yeah, so I, you know, it's funny. The first social media account I think that is like important to me would be Facebook because you needed a .edu account. But if I think back, I remember the MySpace days. I'm probably cringing to think about that. And before MySpace, I think there were, um, I used to be into anime and so there were tons of anime blogs, but we'll, we won't go way back into middle school and being made fun of. We'll go straight to MySpace high school days, which honestly, probably when I think about it now was uh, would have served to be some kind of discipline or uh, it shows a lot of direction as to how I interact with social media just because I was always on MySpace. You remember the top eights where you'd rank your friends and people would publicly see who your top eight was. And so there was a very visibleness to social media at that time. But prior to that, yeah, I remember anyone could get on MySpace, but not anybody could get on Facebook. And so it felt a lot more exclusive. So I think that's why it stands out in my mind. Like, oh, I have to get to college. And then once I get to college, I can inherit all these student loans, buy all these books and actually sign into Facebook. The most important part. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, what did you like about it? Like when you were on there, was it just like the creativity of it, connecting to other people? What drew you there? Yeah, well, I think we look at Facebook's goal and mission and thought and they want to build relationships. And initially uh, it, 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 it felt like a place where I could connect with my past, but also get to know the present and then uh, opened up my opportunities for the future people that I would meet. So I got onto Facebook right during um, orientation week for college. And so again, you could connect with all your friends from high school, let them know where you'd been. Uh, you know, all of these college events are happening. So you're wanting to post photos. And you could catch up with friends that way, but then you're also being able to connect with people that you would meet at some of these events. And then it, it just became the new phrase that you said, like, oh, do you have Facebook? Do you have Facebook? What's your name? Like, let me add you. Uh, that that kind of became the, the thing. So at first it felt very new, refreshing, cool, intriguing, uh, just a cool place to put Facebook albums we had tons of albums back then. Now it's kind of like whatever you get lumped into, no one makes albums, you're not cool. But back then it was like, I can, you know, put all of these compartments. So that, that, that was exciting. It felt fresh, it felt refreshing. And it felt like you were really tuning into your network. I, I don't think initially when it started, you felt like you were contacting people you never had met before initially, but it just felt like, oh man, this is all the people that I know in one whole pool. It's almost like relationships with a little bit of steroids in them, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I oh, can yeah. have this network of friends, but now I can keep my old friends, look for new friends, strengthen the friendships that I'm right now. It was just like fuel to the relationship fire. Right. And there were a lot more boundaries then. I mean, you had to really seek out someone's page. You had to type their names in. You had to see if they were in your network. Uh, based on your location or your high school, where now we've kind of got steroids where we can just keep scrolling on stories and pages. So it's changed a, quite a bit um, from how I remember it. How many friends, like when you start adding all your friends, like how many friends did you have back then? Oh man, probably into the hundreds, like 300. And I felt like that was like more than enough. And I looked at my friends ironically yesterday, just thinking about uh, social media and its impact. And I'm like, I'm at one point something thousand. And I'm just like, wow, do you really know all these people? Like, do they actually know you? And then I get into too many existential questions and then I like signed <laughs> off. I'm like, it's too much. That does not, you're, it's too much just to go and feed your son now. <laughs> it's, it's too much thinking. Yeah. yeah. So at some point it did change from like 
sort of the growing of relationships you already had into something else. Was there a point for you when it started to feel uncomfortable or you started to think, gosh, I'm here a lot and, or man, am I really mm. friends with that person? When did that change for you? That's such a good question. I, I'm trying to think back. I don't know that I necessarily started having some of those questions until maybe a couple years ago when I really started doing like audits on my time, uh, looking at um, how comparison worked. Prior to that, social media, you know, so I, I got saved at 18, uh, moved to college and didn't know a lot of Christians. And so social media was was a tool at that point, a force, because I got to meet individuals through YouTube videos and uh, individuals that lived that were friends of friends that became my friends. And so it didn't really feel like, man, this is uncomfortable. Not for me at that point. Uh, it really felt like this was another accountability tool, or this is just another way I can catch up with people. This is a way I can pray for the saints. So I think I embraced it probably, you know, and then I went into college ministry and it was such a tool for the students. They just wanted to be connected online. I think it was seeing how much time it took and how much impact it had on some of my students, uh, then realizing what kind of impact it started to have on me that I really start seeing a negative side to it. But prior to that, it was just a way to connect. Yeah, it was comparison so snuck in a lot later. That's so interesting. And I think you're right that sometimes we can see the negative effects in somebody else's life first, right? Of like, oh, right. what that oh, looks yeah, like. Oh yeah, always. Your time on there, like, oh man, she's on there too much. Um, before, but then boy, to turn that mirror back around to yourself and be like, oh, do oh I for sure. Yeah. The log is always more appealing in someone else's yeah. eye. Like, that's a huge, like 10 by, I can't measure wood, whatever long amount of a piece of wood would be <laughs> to my spec. And so, yeah, yeah, it's very easy. And I mean, you see so many students coming in and out of your apartment every day as I worked as a resident director. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. What a habit. When really I would end our interactions and go do the same thing, but it felt more sophisticated, perhaps because I was older, but there really wasn't much of a difference. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, so mo like you, okay, so you got on a, for connection. Most, mm -hmm. most people do. I think when we did our, we did a TGC survey and nine out of 10 women said they got on to social media to connect and then they stay on to connect with friends and family as well. They want those relationships. But here's my question for you. If being in relationship means to know somebody and to be known, mm -hmm. and you really know this, like living with, you have lots of experiences of living with people where you're really, mm -hmm. known and you know, people really well is is that an experience that we can get from social media? Yeah. You know, I think even, uh, it, you know, I, I can't help but to, to think about the word know and be known and what that looks like. I think in this society, we're always trying to find our identity and sometimes myself. I mean, I can only really put my business out there because I can't speak for everybody else, but I can just say my friend, which is really just me, um, right? Uh, it is a hard thing because our identity, honestly, the only thing that is sure and steadfast is what's anchored in Christ. Everything else can change from one minute to the next. So I think when you say, you know, I've had experiences of really being known, when I look back on those experiences, I realize that I I was giving that individual the benefit of the doubt because they had spent time with me and proximity and had quality, but really who can truly know us besides Christ? Um, who can truly know us besides God? Who really has that power? And it, it's taken social media for me to think through, um, yeah, we wanna be known and want people to tell us who we are, but we don't even know who we are. And I don't necessarily think that that's always the goal, uh, although we make that the goal, but it's unattainable. Uh, to truly fully know. So I guess when you ask me that question, I'm thinking, well, yeah, I, I definitely go to social media to, to find things out about myself, but how dangerous is that? It's, it can be pretty concerning um, ultimately. And then we can hold other people to standards of knowing us or uh, obtaining this level of being known that I think only God really can do. And so it, it cheapens your social media experience, if that's what we're going in for, is to, to look for pages of how to define ourselves outside of how God has told us he defines us. Everything else has a lot more space 
to, to live. And I think sometimes we look for identity in our social media interactions with individuals to tell us who we are and who we're not. And again, that's comparison. And it can get, um, it can keep you afloat for a while, but it can be incredibly discouraging um, in other contexts. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. I guess it's like, how, who can really know somebody besides yeah. God? And, and so I'm, I'm not going to hold myself to that necessarily. Um, but I do when I interact on social media, you know? Yeah, I think, I think you're totally right. I think there's a, uh, maybe a promise of social media that you would know a lot of people really well and they would, would know you, right? You're sort of taking them along in your life with you. Like, oh, right. look, now I'm here. Or, oh, look, now I'm over here. Like, yeah. kind of walking along with them in their lives. Um, kind of, but it's not really the same. Kind of, yeah. Like, right. Like, for ice cream is a lot different than uh, like, I'm taking a picture of my ice cream and you're taking a picture of your ice cream. And then we kind of feel like we both had ice cream. Um, right, right, right. You know, that's different than us, like, spending time together and rubbing against each other in ways that shape yeah, each other. Um, exactly. Yeah. I just wonder if being like, you know, like knowing, just being aware, like there's a, a level of relationship that social media can't get us to maybe. Right. I think that that awareness helps you actually um, cultivate relationships with, with better expectations mm -hmm. and also step back. I mean, how many times, have we like looked at someone on social media who is like six degrees removed from us? We don't really, really know them. And we start to curate all their experiences. And then we have this narrative about who they are, but really we don't know them at all. And so if that can happen, you know, how much more people we think we know a different aspect, you know, I curate my Instagram ex experiences. I post what I choose to post. I don't post certain things. And so it would be very dangerous. Um, it could be concerning to have someone build a narrative of knowing me on that. Although it is a form of knowing me, it's just not, it's not a, a very deep form. I think we, um, when you said that rubbing against and shaping, that kind of happens most living among each other and walking. So that kind of limits us, but I don't think that that's a bad thing. And I think social media kind of gives us that, um, makes us feel the power of being everywhere and knowing everything. I think you're totally right. And that makes me think about, you know, my next question of, um, we sort of feel like we're omniscient and omnipresent. And we also feel like whether it's a person that's six degrees from us or one degree from us, really, if they say something on social media that fits into a narrative in our head of like, oh, did she say she, you know, is worried about Omicron and so wants to wear a mask? Like then I, mm -hmm. all of a sudden I feel like I can fill in all these other blanks about that person. Like, oh, I know who she is. And either I really like her instantly or I really don't like her instantly. Um, yeah. So there's kind of this one dimension, like I'm taking one piece of information and building what I think that I know about her, which of course people are doing to us as well. And my question is, we know that's not right. Like, you know, we know there's more to a person than that. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of stop yourself from, or like slow that down or come at that in a more healthy way? Yeah. Uh, in terms of not assuming uh, I know the, the write-up or the narrative on someone. Well, I mean, I wish I could tell you that I um, am super noble. The Holy Spirit descends upon me every time I'm about to make a horrible judgment. But it's people. People help me. Um, primarily my husband. He's around me the most, and he hears my most unfiltered comments <laughs> um, and my friends. And, again, you can't really dislike who you pray for. Um, for too long. You can't really uh, remove myself from, you know, different preferences. So uh, the way that I keep myself under guardrails is one, um, be willing to step away from the social media persona of that person or their profile for a season of a time and actually pray for them. And if I have an opportunity, reach out to them. Now this, this is if someone is in my proximity, because I feel like that's more of the difficulty is with, you know, COVID and preferences. And now I'm a mom. So there's a whole plethora of preferences. I had no idea existed. Should you use essential oils? Should you not? Should you homeschool? Should you not? Should you sleep train? Sleep, sleep train? Should you not sleep train? My goodness. And so, um, and people will post their, you know, little characters. Um, I think Twitter is more dangerous for me uh, and make their, their, their things known. And so for me, I have to take a step away from that and intentionally remind myself of the humanity of that person. And then remind myself that we don't actually have to agree. Social media kind of gives us that image that you put this um, this photo up or this status or you shared something and then every one of your ideologies lines up with that. And it's like, we don't even wanna be held 
accountable for stuff we thought about 10 years ago that may have changed. I don't, I don't know these things. So it's other people around me. It's my husband just asking me questions um, that aren't even like super deep. They're just like, Oh, like, do you know that person? And I'm like, Oh, I actually don't <laughs> like that actually helps stop me and splash water in my face to help me think I actually don't, I, I don't, I don't actually know this person. And if I do know this person and they are posting things that are just different, I really do have to remember that they're made in the image of God. Like it sounds very elementary, but it helps me. Um, and then when I look at scripture and realizing all that I'm called to, uh, exercising the fruit of the spirit, self-control and patience, gentleness, love, I, there's really not a lot of room for me then to tear that person apart. Now, there might be things that I mean, need to do for the sake of my own conscience, for the sake of my own soul, but it protects me. And I think the Holy Spirit keeps a really short leash on me by God's grace, because I could go pretty wild very quickly. So people in the Holy Spirit, yeah. Yeah, no, I think you're not alone in that. Um, more than half the women who responded to our survey said that they are sometimes feel irritated by other people on social media. Oh, yeah. Um, for sure. And of course, we feel irritated with people in real life, too. So it's not that quickly <laughs> that we feel ir irritated on social no, media. No, yeah. But it does seem like going on social media, our whole point to be there was to connect with people, right? And to like be with our friends and like show our pictures of our baby or, you know, uh, know and be known with people that we like and yeah. love. So it seems like to go on social media and, and come away feeling irritated or that you like someone less than you did when you went on works in opposition to the whole point of why we wanted to be there in the first place like is it yeah can social media make us less connected to other people yeah of course it can i mean i i think of so many studies done of, of individuals feeling more isolated after they've just interacted on social media and it's because they're we're not interacting with flesh and blood uh and we're instead interacting with screens that are just relaying so much information to us without relationship and so, um, of course, it, it can make us um, less irritable. Um, I think it too, again, I keep bringing up the fact that we're limited. I don't think we recognize that God has given us 24 hours of the day and he's called us to steward those things. And I, I'd say he calls us to steward those things with a lot less than we probably do. Um, if I just think of what God has called me to in terms of my roles and my responsibilities, I have a very little time um, left for doing anything else than connecting. I, I think it's so interesting whenever I take a break from social media and I come back, you know, I'll say, oh, I just want to see how so-and-so is doing. I can accomplish that in a probably five to 10 minutes. And it's usually the 15, 30 minutes after that, that I get myself in trouble with um, scrolling and thinking and researching. So I, I do think um, social media can serve to make us a lot more isolated because we're not actually spending time with the people that God has around us. And maybe we don't want to spend time with the people that God has around us. And that might be something that the Holy Spirit is bringing to mind. Uh, we can go to escape because I don't have to spend time praying for, crying with, walking with a sister or a brother or asking for forgiveness or uh, reading God's word or taking a walk. I mean, there's so many other things. So I'm not here to bash it. I'm just saying it has taken the place of a lot of things that God has called us to do in, in, um, in that way. So it's just something to be stewarded to think about it that way. I love that you say that. And it makes me think about um, like the food pyramid, right? Of like yeah. this goes on the bottom and then the next and then the next and then so I'm thinking like if there was a relationship pyramid, yeah, what your relationship pyramid look like, like what's the bottom, probably mm. social media is toward the top, I would guess. Yeah. It's probably like candy. Yeah. I mean, at that point, I'm, I obviously my brain goes straight to the top because I'm like, well, I know exactly what's up there, uh, <laughs> the top of the pyramid, the small <laughs> slither. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I keep, you know, something that has protected my fingers from Twitter. I always say I'm getting ready to, to let the world know what I think about something, which is the world is like 40 followers. I'm by no means an influencer. No one knows who I am. But um, so I go on there and I'm like, wow, you know what keeps me from that? Thinking about my neighbor outside. Like it, it almost, it keeps me from generalizations. It keeps me from being short because I think about the opportunity that I have to influence who is actually in my line of, of life. So when I think about that, that bottom, I think 
local church, I think actual neighborhood, I think community, I think people that I am accountable to, my family, my friends. Um, and from then on, maybe my job, um, I work at One Hope or, or work at the Garden Church. So it's like, who can I influence that way with what I write, with what I believe, with how I coach? And then when we get through there, I'm like, okay, well, I've got the local church, my actual family, okay, my job. Then I think, okay, extracurriculars, which are individuals that I have met online, who I have made relationships with. I mean, I've been to a TGC conference and have met individuals that I've only got to spend an hour with, but it was such a meaningful hour and lunch. And so we're only connected online. And so I think there's space for saying, let me use something that God has given me an opportunity to cultivate. That's amoral. I can use a very good or in a bad way. Great. And by the end of that leaves like the scrolling kind of trivial, dubious at best um, category of does this, will this do anything for God's kingdom? Does this help me love God more? Does this help my neighbor love God more? Is this even worth my time? Could this be dangerous in the realms of gossip? Could this be slander? Could this be malicious intent? And I just think, just like the proverb said, where there are words, you know, transgression is not far off. Oftentimes, once you have exercised all those other categories, what's left is, is that I can only be here for a bit. Um, or, you know, yield my influence in this way. So I, I think realistically, though, we don't always do that. Realistically, that top candy portion is at the bottom. And I think other way, other opportunities starve because of that. And so, again, that's it's like what we formally know, what we functionally do is different. But I, I really do think we're missing out a lot on the living together, walking with each other, extending forgiveness. I mean, a grudge can continue online, but a grudge can be squashed with a simple conversation of I forgive you or listening to actually understand and having a difference of opinions where sometimes a post does not afford us all the opportunities to, to think that way, you know, especially during election season, which I think we're still reeling from that. You know, we're reeling from COVID, we're reeling from all those things. And it's so easy to just typecast somebody based on who they voted for, uh, what they think about certain words, uh, beliefs, what their views on immigration, instead of saying, let's sit, let's labor together, let's walk through this, let's um, listen to understand each other. Yeah, yeah. that's so good. Um, I want to know how do you actually get there? Like, how do yeah. you make it? So social media is the top of the pyramid and how do you make it so you don't lose all that time and starve out those other relationships? Are there, when you think about your own social media use, um, mm. I think Ouch. I'm, I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> or are maybe there, are there, do you set a timer? Like, are there, do you try and get off? Do you curate who follows you? I know your Instagram is private. Is that a step that you're taking? Talk us yeah. through what are the, you know, boots on the ground ways that you try and make your relationship pyramid the right way. Yeah. I love that you asked that question for two reasons. One, uh, because we can talk about these high and lofty things and we can quote scripture about um, the days are evil and, you know, only God knows us. He's the one who knows everything when our hearts condemn us. And these are great texts and the word is sufficient, but I love that you asked that because you can hear something like this and be like, okay, so that doesn't apply to me. I also like that you asked that for a second reason is, is because I'm a normal, regular person who, um, you know, it just seems like it's a good question for, for normal folks like me. So the first thing that popped in my head when he said that is mostly I just need to mind my business, right? I tell people <laughs> that I'm just trying to brush my teeth every day when they're like, Oh, you know, what are you, what are you? I'm like, I'm trying to brush my teeth and show up at work, right? Very simple task. What's the next thing. And so, um, as far as the timer goes and different methods, I think you really got to look at what's, what's good for you, uh, personally, but to do something small and tangible. So I'm notoriously known for deleting Instagram off my phone about like 30 times a, uh, a month, which you're thinking, is that every day? Sometimes, <laughs> <I'm thinking> that. <laughs> sometimes, um, no real talk. I, I do, uh, I will delete an app and remove myself. Cause the lie 
I think, okay, the first step would be, okay, what are some of the lies I'm choosing to believe by dwelling on this? Or what do I want out of this? And so if what I want out of it is to connect with people, I can do that for five minutes um, on my browser. I really can. And then I need to be okay with letting that be my appetite. But I think even more so it's filling my appetite of other things, which is saying, wow, I have my son and I could scroll on this phone right now, or I could just soak in the fact that he learned how to giggle a little longer. I really have to teach myself to like ask God to open up my eyes to see that and to fill that appetite up. So I do only interact with social media for what I get. And so much so that when I do more of that, it makes me sick, which might be the Lord that's just like kind to me where I'm like, wow, my eyes hurt and my head hurts and I'm feeling like I need to buy new furniture for my house and I need a vacation now. Like I just, I wouldn't have those needs if I, if I starved that and maybe filled my appetite with other things. So practical things is um, honestly not going to social media first thing in the morning. I honestly like running to God's word is just such a, it's way better. All the days that I scroll first, Oh, it's detrimental. It's just like, I already know. God is, it's only going to be God's grace to like turn the course, but I've already started looking at other things that aren't mine and wanting things that aren't mine or comparing myself for not being as bad as someone else. So already on a horrible place. I mean, they're Pharisee or I'm like, God be merciful to me. So practical things are don't start your every day uh, with, with social media, start it with something else. Even if that's a walk, do something else. Um, and then um, it would be, yes, I, I have to schedule time. I need guardrails because I can scroll for 30 minutes and I'm like, where does that time go? So guardrails, uh, telling people around me how long I want to spend on something. I don't care how crazy that sounds, but I'm like, hey, I need to get off this in five minutes. I only want to be here for a little bit. Um, and then deleting apps off my phone and making it harder uh, to go to them. Because uh, after a while, I've forgotten my Instagram password. I had to sign in today and like oh I don't even remember what that is and it actually does well for my for my system and I think um when I do sign on there remembering that that other person is sending me the same curated experience Mm -hmm. uh and so we're both trying to figure this out um as far as my private account I did that and my husband's is private too and it hasn't always been so I asked him like oh why'd you make your private your profile private and he said one you don't want pictures of our baby everywhere i'm like oh yeah i remember i did have that conversation but two um i wanted less pressure and for some reason i felt like making it private felt like whether i post or i don't post or i scroll or i don't scroll there's no expectation of me keeping up with the trends or the tiktoks or what's popular i can just it's arbitrary. I can do it if I want to. I can do it to update friends and family and let them know what's going on or not. So I think it just made it less complicated for me personally. Um, There's no following. People aren't hoping to see what I post next. I'm not held in bondage that way. And so being private just makes it helpful. And I, I think my husband said this the other day when I asked him too. he said, you know, ultimately, um, everyone doesn't really know me. And so when I open up my world to everybody, it kind of makes me feel like I need to maintain those relationships that those main those relationships aren't trying to maintain a relationship with me. And I thought that was profound. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, am I, am I going to be a slave to this or am I going to use it for mm-hmm. God's kingdom? And I do think we got to ask each other that question. Like, is it enough just to be neutral? Like what is neutral anyway? So I want to make sure that when I do post, I'm doing it for some sort of influence, mm, That's good. whether, you know, it'd be good. Hopefully that's the hope. Yeah. yeah. Do you think um, that having real life, healthy relationships and friendships is kind of an antidote to the online experience? Yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yes. For all of all that real relationships do. I think um, I keep jumping to forgiveness because I think it's so supernatural that God even grants us forgiveness and gives us the opportunity to do that. But you know what you can't communicate that with? Like a post, right? A conversation where two people have expressed their grievances, their desires, how they were hurt, and then applying the truth of the gospel to that and then seeing each other in church next week or down the street. It's, it's, I mean, it is the anecdote. I have, I have no time but to mind my business with the actual people in front of me 
um, that what's left is just what's left. So I, I'm, I mean, I'm going to push relationships every, every time there's something that we get from connecting and it's not just always having to walk through hard things. It's enjoyable things, right? Um, I think Tim Keller was talking about this in a podcast, I think for TBC actually, about how, you know, things like sunrises, um, he's enjoying things a lot more since his recent um, diagnosis. And I think social media always shows me that there's more that I don't have. Whereas when I am doing real relationships, being in the city, the brick looks cooler to me. The sunset looks great. The hydrant that is broken, that I complain about all the water leaking is more of an opportunity for kids to run and, and to play in it. And so I do think it changes our perspective, our mind and our thinking. And it helps me realize in my limitedness, helps me stare at the the infinite God that is not limited in the same way. And so that happens in relationship even the pace of relationship being slower to have dinner or to eat or to have someone over or to do that walk slows me down where social media just makes me think I can be everywhere at once and I have to gather those experiences. And if I don't feel a certain way, then that brings shame upon me where I think living in the here and now with people as much as possible uh, just does something else. And I prefer it. I think life is better that way. Mm, I think that's really good. I think that's super, like when you say it's slowing, like real life slows you down, that's that's really hitting me. Like that's just true because on, yeah. you know, on social media it feels, you're right, like you can be here and then you can be here and, oh, look, now I'm doing this, now I'm doing this. Um, look, she's doing that. Like, um, the yeah, it comes across yeah. as fast. It's instant, right? Um, and it yeah. just... Uh, and it's almost like a 24 hour news scroll too, right? You're like, yeah, it's always happening. Um, we're not meant to carry all that pressure. I get so sad when I'm like, oh man, should I be praying for this, 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 and this, and this, and I'm, and, and really God is the only one who has the capacity to, to, to hold all those things. And I can go to him. That's uh, really those things. Yeah. Oh, I think that's really good. That's just a really important. Yeah. thing. you can't know all the things about all the people. Um, mm -hmm. And you're not meant yeah. to, so. Yeah, and isn't it humbling yeah. when you realize that there's a million other details in that person that annoys me, uh, a million other details in their lives that I'm not privy to, that if I were privy to, uh, would have me approach them in a lot different different ways. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't that, wouldn't that bring compassion in our interactions? And um, I get that we're a lot more, we're indoors a lot more now, but I do think um, there are even opportunities that God affords us uh, very small opportunities that we can do being present in people's lives that um, social media just sucks that time. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you this. Okay. When you think about friendships and relationships online, we can kind of rate those almost, right? Like I can unfollow you or block mm -hmm. you or how do you, or choose not, or choose to friend you or, you know, not, um, but you don't really do that at, like at church. I mean, you kind of do like in the people you choose to talk to or your or classmates or stuff, but you're still running across those people. Like, how do you think right. about, you know, who you pick? Are there times that you are like, okay, this is a time when I need to unfollow or this is a time, like, this is really, um, you know, I'd like you better if I didn't see you online or like, you know, like mm. how do you um, think about th that way that we kind of, formalize our relationship bonds yeah as you say that i i think of a couple of things one uh, i think of james too and, and thinking about partiality uh, i think it's easier to recognize partiality when i'm in a local church when i'm in a community uh when i'm, I'm thinking about my preferences mm -hmm. and so i think the local church and being part of a community just affords me the opportunity to to be confronted with that i live in a really dense um, a city, I, I know this not everybody's context, but you know, over half of our members live within walking distance. So that means I'm running into people often. Um, you know, I, I live in a neighborhood where just the next block are three different types of members from our church and we can walk to church. And so I keep emphasizing the local church and community because that, that is just the world I live in where I could just walk out here and interact a lot more and be confronted. Uh, I, but then I also think of another thing, which is wisdom. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if, if some, if an interaction online is keeping me from loving someone who is made in the image of God, then I say, I can remove myself from that interaction. So does that mean I unfollow people that, um, seeing their post 
uh, continues to have me um, spread a false narrative about who they are, yeah. And maybe I need to, as a weaker sister, to do that, uh, to unfollow them so that I might love them like Christ loves them. Uh, so I, I, I feel like it doesn't need to be some like hard, fast commandment of like, oh, I unfollowed you. That must mean I hate you. No, I unfollowed you because it's easier for me to love you as you are physically than it is for me to love the persona that you put online. Cause it's not all of you, it's not all of who you are. And, uh, to keep myself from falling into that thread, it's just easier just not to see your posts yeah. and to, and to, and to engage with you in a different way. Uh, slower over tea over coffee or pray for you so I I, I want to say that's different from canceling people and you know everyone wants to remove everyone toxic from their lives where we really rarely think am I actually possibly the toxic person <laughs> maybe um and the great the, the goodness is there's hope for that in the gospel like come come see drink um those who are heavy heavy laden but we might sometimes be the problem. So sometimes I just remove myself from the uh, online persona because I need to really look into uh, my own patterns and recognize maybe I'm not, I'm not the protagonist in this story. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, do whatever it takes to pursue peace. Yeah. So if that means unfollow, great. If that means log off, great. Don't fall into that threat of like, wow, if I log off of here, I'm going to miss something that everyone else is having. Like I have FOMO in the best, like better than the best of them. And having a son has removed me from a lot of social interactions where I'm like, oh wow, the quality of relationship is still intact here. I'm still love and known. I'm just not everywhere. I'm just trying to mind my business right here in the 21217. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of work to do here. So yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um I'm just gonna keep going because I just have another question. I don't know. Oh if yeah. I'm on there or not, but um, what about? So, do you still have a thousand friends? Reality or on Facebook? Like on Facebook, like how do you yeah. make a thousand friends? I don't know. I will say I love being connected to individuals, so I do try to actually like know those who I friend or have had some kind of relationship touch point. I think being in ministry uh, and meeting a lot of different individuals affords more friends but again definition of what friends mean do i have a thousand ride or dies do i have a thousand individuals that are calling me out on sin of course not i have a very close circle i'd say a close circle of like 10 to 20 individuals who've known me in different circles that can um, love me well uh, and probably five to six that know me when i'm weeping and grieving and sobbing um, it's been a long year a long year and a half i'm combining 2020 into 2022 it's all one year and so that has been full of really great moments and really hard moments and so i have a, a small circle of friends but no i'd like to say uh when i remove the pressure of what people need to be for me i, I do know a lot of people and love them um, but they're not all my you know inner circle friends um if that if that uh, answers the question but yeah so yes for a thousand friends but some of those folks you know, friends, people do purgings and stuff. I have no time. I, yeah. If you made it into the grandfather of my Facebook before I cared about curating these experiences, then you're just my friend. And there's not much for you to see on there that you would be entertained by. But if you're on there and you see what I'm up to, then that's great too. So I hope that answered your question. So yes and no. It's just interesting because I'm thinking about, and this go. I mean, this goes way off track of where we yeah. need to be. But like when you think about posting, um, mm -hmm. like you're posting for both your best friends and that random person you met at camp one time. Yeah. Um, that's a pretty wide range of, you know, people who are consuming you. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's kind of why I've gone private in the sense that I just don't want to be consumed or wanting that information to be everywhere at once, but I'm also not going to backtrack that'll like, you know, sometimes I do, but, um, uh, yeah, it, it, um, yeah, being available to everyone is what that sometimes feels like on yeah. social media. But I do think that's mostly a millennial type of thinking. Like as I look at the older people in my life, um, some older saints, they're not consumed by what people post. They kind of post and they're off. Then I have some other older people in my life who are consumed by what's posted and they take it as truth and they, they're, they're, they're run by fear. And so I'm kind of looking at both of those worlds and I want to be somewhere in the middle that says, I post to influence, I post to interact, but ultimately these individuals are not a, um, 
an example or reflection of me. It's too much to bear. So I'm just like, I'm, I'm here. Um, if I, yeah, it's just more, more of a, yeah, it sounds selfish, but it's more of a limited capacity of I can only control what I, I can control. And I kind of dip out for all the other things. I don't want to be ridden by fear. Um, and I also don't want to post in an apathetic way that doesn't consider my audience, but it is wide, you know, it is a wide, wide array. Do you, if I, I'm a terrible poster, um, if <laughs> I am not posting and I, I am like kind of choosing not to share, am I then not doing a good job of building relationships or letting people know me? Yeah, good question. I'm wondering if that's what people feel held by that standard. But again, those are the unwritten rules of social media in which it has now, I'm now becoming a slave of it and posting versus not. My husband, I, I use my husband a lot because again, I watching someone who's so different than me interact. He doesn't think twice about a post. He's not mulling over a caption. Um, he's not held by the same restraints. So he posts I tell people, you want to know what's going on with me and my baby, just hit up Kevin. I'm sure he know he's posted. For me, as for me in my mind, it's too much thought. And so um, if I feel like I'm being pressured by those constraints, I realize that that's keeping me from something else. And so I remove myself from that situation um, because I don't want to build a platform or feel like there's pressure there. So there's different types of people. There's people that feel no pressure and they post every update, every emotion, every type of sadness and that is maybe what where they feel like they're at with their conscience and I would ask them why do you post is it to maintain is it to um, uplift is it to feel this certain way in the same way I ask myself are you posting by compulsion or you're posting by wanting people to think a certain way of you it's a fair question and so when I feel like I'm starting to feel bogged down by that question should I post more should I not post more should I post more sad should I post more happy I'm like ooh these questions in and of itself is calling for me to pull away and until it becomes an arbitrary function for me in which I want to influence um, just by what I influence slightly, then I'll post more freely. But you'll notice I haven't posted in darn well seven months because I'm currently asking myself, why do you even do this? Is there, is there a compulsion there? And the answer is yes, which is why I'm not posting. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know that it's free to me right now. So I just don't. But I, I love the people in my life that can freely post um, without comparison or compulsion. They just kind of want to let people know what's going on. There's space for both of us. There's supposed to be space for the introspective overthinkers. And there's space for those who just want to let grandma know how everyone's doing. Yeah. We can both interact there. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. funny how much we turn it in on ourselves, right? Of like yeah. the, the pressure that you put on yourself. Like, is this, you're right. Did I post too much to sad? Did I post too much? To, am I posting too much? Am I not posting enough? Um, but really, I never think about my friend. You're posting too much sad. You're posting too much happy. You're posting too much. You're not posting enough. Yeah. You know, I don't think there's actually people out there looking at us thinking like, gosh, I'm timing Stephanie and it's been like, yeah. you know, we're doing and those. Yeah, I cut you off. I was gonna say, and those who do curate, because I've been one of those people, oftentimes have other things they need to focus on, to be honest. If I'm angry that someone is telling everyone that they're sad about this one emotion, like there's just a wisdom, maybe I'm, I'm desiring for them to have more wisdom. I can just take that um, energy in a lot of different ways and pray for them to grow in wisdom. Yeah. And not curate their experience. Does that make sense? Like yeah. if you are curating someone's experience, I think if you don't have proximity to them by way of, you know, I disciple a lot of young um, individuals and sometimes I'm like, whoa, Facebook is where our job individuals, you know, where, where people may look to, to give you a place of employment and mm -hmm. maybe you shouldn't post that, you know, um, I'm in relationship with them and I'm able to curate that with different other, uh, other different facets in their lives. Um, other folks who I'm mad that they posted their 18th vacation, that's just on me. They're allowed to do that, you know? They're allowed to cultivate that experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's tricky. Is there enough good? It here? is. Is there enough good here to stick around? Uh, yeah, as we're talking, I'm like, ooh, is this morbid <laughs> or is this hopeful? I don't know. I hope, I hope someone sees it as neutral and they really get to ask the Lord uh, what, what he would have of them and how they think about everything that they do. 
their words are your words are just as accountable online as they are as as we're talking here and there so does that change my interaction it should it should change my interaction am i boasting in my goods yeah. maybe right so is there good i think the question is sure there is but it requires thinking yeah and i don't know that everyone always thinks so that's it you know just requires thinking and consideration yep I think that I think that's perfect. I think you're right. It requires more intention. And I think maybe as a society or at least parts of us in in our society are getting to the point of realizing like this is this probably requires more thinking than we've been giving it. Um in general and not just in social media but in everything else. That's why, you know, I press on relationships because when you sit down and you actually interact with someone and then hold the Bible true or think about these things you're just you're 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 at much more pause we just don't critically think a lot anymore because social media has and so much told us what to feel yeah and so i just do think we should urge ourselves to think wow have i considered these things you know it's just something yeah, yeah. considering that's good stephanie thank you so much this is so fun thank you um, i agree yeah just really worth i feel like we're just starting to open the conversation, um, especially about relationships, I just think there's a lot more for us to learn and, and be introspective about, like, where should this fit on that pyramid and how healthy yeah. is it? And are those expectations my own pressures, you know, that I think I'm growing, rela am I growing relationships on here? Um, yeah, yeah. And not to be so introspective that it, it drives you into a pit, but just to really be uh, examining yourself. Like it's not for this purpose of shame. I'm not here to say that those who spend hours of time on social media are necessarily doing things sinful. I'm here to say it's worth thinking about. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you.